Kenneth McDuff was born on March 26, 1946, in Rosebud, Texas. Growing up, the biggest influence in young McDuff's life was his controlling mother. She was known around town as the Pistol Packin' Mama. When they were at home together, she would constantly give praise and cover for her son, even when he didn't deserve it. By the time McDuff had reached his late teens, he had already been arrested several times for robbery. When asked several years later in an interview for the book Bad Boy from Rosebud, McDuff dismissed these crimes laughing and referring to them as just simple pranks. But these simple pranks would eventually feed way for something far more sinister to happen. On August 6, 1966, 20-year-old McDuff was on his way to Fort Worth, Texas. He wasn't alone, however. He was riding with a new friend he had made recently, an 18-year-old named Roy Dale Green. Roy was known as a simple person, a weakling who could be easily molded. During their night out on the town, McDuff kept talking to Roy about his plans to go pick up girls and commit violence. Roy, however, just thought he was kidding and never really took his plans all that seriously. Around 10 p.m. that night, McDuff and Roy got in their car and headed to Everman, which is a small town to the south of Fort Worth. After driving around for a bit, McDuff and Roy found a baseball field where three teens were hanging out in their car. The three inside that car were 16-year-old Edna Louise Sullivan, her boyfriend 17-year-old Robert Brand, and Robert's 15-year-old cousin Mark Dunham. According to Roy, McDuff stopped his car at the baseball field. After parking, he pulled out a Colt .38 revolver and walked up to the teen's car, ordering the teens out of the vehicle and into the trunk of their own car. With Roy following in McDuff's car, they both drove to a more isolated and secluded area. Once arriving, McDuff took Edna with him in his own car. After begging and pleading for their lives, McDuff shot both Robert and Mark killing them in an act of cold-blooded murder. After the murder, McDuff grew impatient, when he could not close the trunk of the car with their bodies inside. He decided to just back it up into a fence, leaving the trunk open. Afterwards, McDuff and Roy got into McDuff's car and drove away with Edna locked in the trunk. After again finding a safe place, McDuff took an old broomstick from his car. There are parts of what he did with the broomstick I will not mention here. But needless to say, he eventually ends up choking her to death with the broomstick. The vile and horrible act was how Kenneth McDuff became known as the Broomstick Killer. After dumping Edna's body in a tall field of grass, McDuff and Roy headed home. The next day, law enforcement found Robert Brand and Mark Dunham bodies in the trunk of their car. After the news got out, Roy felt guilty and broke down. He ended up leading the police to the body of Edna Sullivan. Once law enforcement got wind of this, McDuff was quickly arrested. In the murder trial that followed, his accomplice Roy Green was the star witness against him. On the stand, Roy seemed completely terrified of McDuff. His voice would constantly drop to an inaudible level which helped convince the jury that he was telling the truth. When McDuff took the stand, he acted like he couldn't have cared less stating that he never killed anyone and that it was all Roy's doing. The jury, however, did not believe the 20-year-old McDuff. In November of 1966, the court found McDuff guilty, and he received a sentence of death in the electric chair by the judge. For six years after the murders happened, McDuff managed to win two different stays of execution. Then in 1972, the Supreme Court overruled the death penalty. When that happened, everyone on death row was switched to a life sentence. That included the likes of Kenneth McDuff. This even allowed for McDuff to apply for parole, and eventually he got very lucky. This happened due to Texas prisons being extremely overcrowded, so much so that it was violating the prisoners' civil rights. To combat this, a deal was struck between Texas Governor Bill Clements and the parole board. The deal stated that in order to relieve overpopulation, 150 Texas inmates would have to be released every single day. Starting with con artists and small-time crooks, they eventually ran out of prisoners who had committed these acts and had to start releasing more big-time inmates. Then in October of 1981, the parole board reached McDuff and somehow made him a free man. His release obviously sent shock and alarms to the people of Central Texas. McDuff moved back to where he grew up in Rosebud. Suddenly, the people of that once safe town began bolting the windows shut and buying guns. All of these fears were validated in July of 1990. On top of everything else, McDuff was also a huge racist. While walking on Main Street, McDuff walks past some African-American kids. He began to harass the children and pulled out a knife. This act alone should have got him sent back to prison for life. But again, due to the overpopulation at the time, McDuff was back on the streets within a few months. Once released, McDuff decided he was finally going to get his life back on track. 
He enrolled at Texas State Technical College in Waco, Texas. He also got a job at a local gas station named Quick Pack. The job didn't last long, however, and McDuff quit within a month. By the summer of 1991, McDuff was back to his old ways, and he started hanging out in a shady side of town called The Cut. The area was known as a hotbed for bars, drugs, and prostitutes. It wasn't long before he was using, buying, and selling drugs. This again should have been more than enough to send McDuff back to prison, but the overworked parole boards let him slip through the cracks. When McDuff realized his newfound freedom, he began to drink and use drugs more and more. He eventually started engaging in violent sex and became a sadist. Late one night in October of 1991, McDuff is pulled over by the police. Inside his pickup truck, the officer saw a woman whose hands were bound, screaming and kicking the windshield trying to escape. McDuff ended up crashing through a roadblock and escaping. The woman in the truck was later identified as Brenda Thompson, a local prostitute. That was the last time Brenda was seen alive. Just a couple days later, another prostitute named Regina Moore vanished. She was last seen getting into a car with McDuff. The Waco police did nothing to stop McDuff, never even checking him out or labeling him a person of interest in the cases. Through lousy police work, McDuff was always free to move on to another victim. On December 29, 1991, McDuff headed to Austin by his side, was a recently made friend named Alva Hank Worley. After driving around for a while, McDuff found his next victim at a car wash. The victim is a 28-year-old Austin resident named Colleen Reed. She was known around town and at her office as a lovely, young, and bright accountant. McDuff slipped out of his car and grabbed her by the throat, shoving her in his own car. Witnesses reported hearing screams and ran to the car wash. There they found Colin's car still there, dripping with suds. After calling and talking with the police, the witnesses reported that they saw a tan Thunderbird slip away from the car wash, going the wrong way on a one-way street. Three months later, a 23-year-old pregnant woman named Melissa Ann Northrup was working a night shift at the Quick Pack, the same gas station McDuff once had worked at. Melissa had expressed in the past that she felt unsafe working the night shift. McDuff, being a former employee, knew of this security weakness. That same night, McDuff was cruising the area looking for drugs. After a while, his car broke down a few hundred feet away from the convenience store. At 4 a.m., Melissa's husband called the store and went to check on her out of worry. When he got there and couldn't find any sign of his wife, he immediately called the police. A few days later, McDuff's car was found by police at the New Road Inn, which is only a block away from the Quick Pack. It was also found that he was missing and reported to not be in the area. With the discovery of the same tan Thunderbird that was also seen in the other three crimes, McDuff became the prime suspect in four different missing women cases. In March of 1992, a massive manhunt began in Central Texas for Kenneth McDuff. Eventually, the police were able to track down and question his friend from earlier Alva Hank Worley. They found Alva at Bloom's Motel off Interstate 35 in Belton, Texas. During the interview, it became clear that Worley knew much more than he was leading on. A few days after the initial interview, Worley was finally willing to talk about McDuff. He told law enforcement that he was with McDuff when he abducted Colin from the car wash. By this point, she had been missing for over four months. A couple days before police began questioning Worley, another crime occurred that could be attached to McDuff. On March 25, 1992, a young man found a body coming out of the ground. The body was found at the campus of Texas State Technical College. Investigators arrived, and they found the body of 22-year-old Valencia K. Joshua. Valencia was a prostitute from Waco, as her last known whereabouts were located in the same area as McDuff. This fifth murder caused police to ramp up their efforts, working 24-7 in order to catch this deranged psychopath. After 57 days of search, on April 26, 1992, the search for Melissa finally came to an end. Her body was found by a fisherman floating in the water. After no new breaks in the case, the police, being desperate, decided to change up their strategies. They contacted America's Most Wanted, a popular crime show that ran on the Fox network. The May 1, 1992 episode ran a story about McDuff. After receiving many tips from across the country, a huge hit comes forward from a man in Missouri. He stated that he recognized McDuff as a man that he worked with at a trash company. 
only he didn't know the man as Kenneth Macduff. He knew him as Richard Fuller. A quick check by the police showed that Richard Fuller was indeed Macduff. Finally, on May 4, 1992, Macduff was caught by law enforcement and flown back to Waco, Texas. Of the five most recent victims, Texas prosecutors felt their strongest case was that against Melissa Ann Northrup. They decided to move forward with her case first. In February of 1993, the trial began in Houston, Texas, for the murder of Melissa. Once sentencing came along, it only took jurors four hours to reach a decision. Macduff was found guilty of capital murder and given the death penalty. A year later, Macduff was also found guilty for the murder of Colleen Reed and received a second death sentence. On November 17, 1998, a little after 6 p.m., Macduff was executed at the age of 52. His last words were, I'm ready to be released, release me. To the very end, he always saw himself as the victim. After the Macduff case, the public demanded that they fix the broken parole system that was letting people like Macduff back onto the streets. During the 90s, Texas completely overhauled his justice system. The changes became known as the Macduff Laws. They made it to where tougher sentences were given to violent offenders and a complete overhaul of parole practices. They also spent more than $2 billion building more prisons and built one of the biggest prison infrastructures in the entire world. To this day, Macduff is the only man in Texas history that was sent to death row, paroled, and sent back for killing again.